Beautiful spring morning. It's a little chilly, but it will be a beautiful day today. And we thank you for tuning in on our Facebook page. Uh, we hope that you find and feel Christ's presence and God loves you this much. And uh, take that to the world. And we'll talk about that a little bit later today, too. So um, if we could, if you will join me in our call to worship. Hear Christ's call. Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. And if you would join me in our invocation. Holy God of love, take hold of us in this act of worship. Hold us until we are blessed with a vision of love a love that is generous, forgiving, mysterious, and profound. A love that will never end. Live in our hearts now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Amazing Grace, and we will be singing the first two verses. So if you're able to stand, please join us as we sing. Scripture reading is 16, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 19, and that can be found on page 564 in the Old Testament of your Pew Bibles. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Uh, there were three prayer requests in the back this morning. Um, the first, uh, Alice Metcalf is at Wasson now and doing much better. So let's keep Alice in our prayers. Um, uh, please pray for Linda's brother, Ron, whose health is failing. And an update on Lenny. Um, she's now at home, um, which is a good thing. Uh, they haven't still done any of the procedures yet, but they're working on regulating her blood pressure and heart rate. Um, does anybody else have anything? 
that I'd like to pray for this morning. If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, who created us from dust and set before us a plan and purpose for your world, we are grateful for this time of worship. We've gathered to hear and proclaim your word, to call on you, to praise you, and to ask you what is good and wholesome for each of us. We thank you for this new season, for the coming of spring. As we reflect on the beauty and new beginning of life to bloom all around us, we are reminded of who you are. Although the days have been dark and cold, you, O oh Lord, have been at work all along in the deep places underground where we cannot always see. You are a God who makes all things new. You never leave or forsake us. Forgive us, Lord, for being so busy that we miss the many ways you reveal yourself to us. And, forgiving, and forgive us for being so consumed and mindful of our own lives that we may miss the, de the needs of those around us. Gracious God, we thank you for loving us when we are unlovable. Thank you that you have loved us even as we have caused harm or offended others. Grant us through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ your forgiveness. We hold before you those who have faced and are facing illness, disease, and distress. We place them in your hands, praying that you work through doctors, nurses, technology, and in ways we do not understand to bring about their healing. We specifically offer up Alice and Lenny and Ron for your healing and your care. We are grateful, O oh God, that you have called us together and loved us so much that we can love one another. We offer ourselves to you for that purpose in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Todd. We decided to change up the uh, flow of the service a little bit, so we'll have the, my message now, and uh, we'll have communion at the end of the service. I guess one of the questions I want to ask is, have you ever felt overwhelmed in your lives? Can I get an amen on that one? Sometimes we feel helpless, hopeless, even defeated. Maybe you just can't seem to think straight. Or maybe you just can't see any good or even a good way out of any kind of particularly troubling moment in your life. I know I've been there. So how do you make sense of some of these situations that uh, seem entirely out of control? Well, one, you can hide under the covers, I guess but uh, eventually they still come to you and you have to ask yourself will whatever situation it is will this be the same a year from now six months from now even six days from now is it that important of a situation something that uh, troubling or is it uh, are you going to look at uh, Maybe down the road a little bit, it's not going to be quite as troubling. Maybe you start looking at it objectively and you start to realize that some things in our lives just seem to overwhelm us that aren't really that important in life also. So with this new perspective that we can come up with anyways, 
we start to focus on the more important things in life. So I hope you're kind of asking now, okay, Rich, where are you going with this, right? And maybe what are these important things versus the things that we think are so important? We have to first understand that the world offers us many things, does it not? Especially things that (laughs) are really good at distracting us from other things in life. There's sometimes the world gives us these really, really important things that we need. Advertising tells us that we need uh, that uh, pillow, right? Or maybe some of those slippers. Maybe our, our teeth need to be whiter. And maybe we need that newest cell phone that costs $2,000 now, just because. And, and how about the one that we all need? Is That's a car now that is going to drive for us. Of course, we need all these things now to survive. That's what we're told, right? And those things just really do block our minds sometimes. The world and all of these powerful influences that it throws at us every day constantly tugs at us, and it tugs away from our faithfulness in God. There is an importance there, see. It tugs us away from God toward an obsession of things. Things that in life really, when you really think about it, don't matter. So how can we recognize important things in our lives, the faithful things in our lives? I think our scripture today, which is the road to Emmaus, gives us some guidance of how to focus on important things in our life. So as I read the scripture, this is what I want you to do. I want you to think about how overwhelmed and defeated that these two persons are, these two disciples out on the road. How must they really feel? And how are in the world are they going to sort out what's important? And also, as I read the scripture, I'd like you to listen for Jesus' question to them, because he's going to ask them a great question. He says, what things? What things are important? I'll be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 24, if you'd like to follow along. Page 90 of the New Testament on a pew Bible, if you have one out. And I'll be reading verses 13 through through 35. Luke writes, Now on the same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and they, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk? And they stood still, their faces were downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these past days? And Jesus said, What things? Why, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's now the third day since all of this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find a body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had told them. And he said, but one of them did see. And he said to them, how, Jesus then said, how foolish are you, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning him. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus asked, if uh, uh, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, 
He took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. May God add his blessings to those marvelous words. It's a great story, isn't it? We've all know that story. We've heard it, um, I don't want to say countless times, but we've heard it often. But what I'd like to say is there are actually three lessons within this story that I think we need to look at today. One is we're going to look at things, and we've already been looking at things. But also we're going to look at direction. What is our direction? And then we're going to look at the road. Luke writes, after Jesus' crucifixion, death, and burial, he brings us a story about a couple of disciples that are traveling out of Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus actually is a small little town, roughly seven miles to the south and to the east of Jerusalem. We know the city was there. I just have to say this quick. But we know the city, the little town was there at one point, but they have never been able to pinpoint exactly where Emmaus is now. For some reason, something has just um, taken everything away. But we know with this, with a couple other lessons, that yes, Emmaus did, did at one point be there. Now, right away, though, in this story, what do we get? We get a glimpse into this very state of mind of these two disciples. Are they aware of what's important? <laughs> Actually, we're told that they are headed out of town. See, there's a direction. So our question first needs to ask, are they going in the right direction, or are they going in the wrong direction? Hmm. Don't know. This point, we really don't know, but we'll get there. However, along comes a stranger who joins them as they are walking along out of town. Now, as the stranger comes up and catches up with them, I have to say also, especially if you paid attention to some of the words that were in Luke, they were despondent. They were walking along, and when you were sad and walking along, you're not walking fast, are you? You're kind of shuffling, and if you're with somebody, what are you doing? You're kind of kicking rocks as you go. You're kind of stopping and trying to get a conversation going again. Maybe you're crying a little bit. So they're sauntering along, going away from Jerusalem. And along comes a stranger. You and I, thanks to Luke, we know that it is the risen Christ. But the disciples don't recognize him. People for generations have really thought, why didn't they? Why does he look? Does he look differently? Is he in a disguise? Forgive me, I don't mean, but is he wearing Groucho glasses or something where they just can't really see who this person is? Or is there something else going on here, some kind of force going on? Luke tells us that uh, they were kept from recognizing him. That's verse 16. But what does that mean? Did God blind them, put that veil in front of their eyes at that point? Or were they just so distraught that they couldn't think clearly? They couldn't see clearly. They couldn't see what was right in front of them. You know, I think God takes some of these moments in our lives when we're not seeing clearly, we're not thinking clearly. And these are those moments when we're so overwhelmed, that's where he helps us. He helps to clear away those unimportant things that we can get to a point where we can begin to understand more clearly reasons, more clearly the purposes, and then to help us see truth and what matters most in our lives. So you see, Jesus is there. Keep that thought. Because Jesus patiently walks along with them, and he asks them about what they were talking about. Now, the two of them, they're shocked when they hear this. What do you mean? You don't know what we're talking about? This stranger is una unaware of the things that happened over the past week in Jerusalem. And I love Jesus' question. And I love the reaction to the question. He says, what things? 
Well, let's think about this a second. It's like Jesus really didn't know, right? In fact, I think there's a little testing going on here to see where these two disciples' minds really are. I think that's why Jesus is saying what he's saying. How deep is your faith? How deep are you? Do you really commit yourself to me? Now, Cleopas and the other, they begin to list all of the things that had happened. Of course, he said Jesus of Nazareth, which I think is very interesting here, because before Jesus crucifixion, he was the Christ, the Messiah, right? To all of the disciples. The inner and Cleopas and this other are on that edge of the 12. They're the next batch of disciples. They're very close to all of them. But note, he says now it's just this Jesus of Nazareth. Hmm. I think that's kind of sad when you think about it. He was our Christ until they killed him. And then, oh golly, what we thought was going to happen bombed, didn't happen. He's gone. So he's just Jesus of Nazareth. They really hoped that he was there to redeem Israel. But he was arrested, crucified, dead, and buried. But then, just this morning, as they said to Jesus again, some of the women told us an amazing story of an empty tomb, singing angels, and claimed to see Jesus was alive. And even one woman said that she talked with him, spoke with this Jesus. Now, if you remember earlier, I said, are they in the right direction or the wrong direction? Ask yourself this. If you were there on that first morning and someone came running back and said, I saw the Lord, he's alive, would you want to maybe hang around a little bit to see if that might be true or maybe something will happen later in that day? Don't you think they should have done that? What did they do? (laughs) They just turned and went out on the road and started walking away. Isn't that what happens to us a lot of times when we find ourselves blinded by grief, sadness, and hopelessness? We just saunter away in the wrong direction. Actually, I can think Jesus maybe is smiling to himself here just a little bit. Because, see, they were followers. They were in that inner circle. They loved. They knew what had happened. But they forgot the other thing that Jesus had told them time and time again. Yes, they're going to kill me, but in three days, I will be back. I will arise. Hmm. So Jesus says to them, and I think this is kind of a mm, a harsh thing that he's just saying, how dense can you be? Forgive me, but that's the only way I can think that. He says, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And he said that in verses 25 and 26. So if you think about it, what Jesus is saying here is uh, it appears this stranger knows more than he's letting on. Shouldn't that have been something that these two might have went, hmm, but nope. But before we continue, there's a couple of words that we need to make sure that we understand here, too. Jesus says, slow of heart to believe. Now, in our English language, we sit here and we know what heart means. It's a very emotional thing, right? And that's okay. That's our emotions. It's our core of emotions. But in Hebrew, not only is it emotion, but heart actually equals the mind and the thought and the understanding. So when Jesus said that you are foolish and slow of heart to believe, he's also saying that you're not getting this, you're not understanding this, your mind is not engaged. Come on, folks, get going, see? That's what he's trying to tell them. Jesus is addressing, though, their minds, and he will now lead them through some scripture to a greater understanding through the emotion and understanding of the heart. Jesus uses the words of the prophets to begin to reveal himself by listing the things that needed to happen to the Messiah first. Things they knew. We have to understand, these disciples knew the Old Testament. They knew the prophets, the prophetic readings and the writings 
for the Messiah to come. So we don't know what verses Jesus might have, and of course they weren't verses then, they were just statements in, in the Old Testament, but here's a few examples I wrote down, if you don't mind, that he might have used. In Deuteronomy 18.15, it says, the Lord your God will raise you up, will raise up for you a prophet like, um, like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. So we've heard those words before, listen to him. Psalm 2 verse 7 says, you are my son and today I have become your father. Psalm 16.10 says, because you will not abandon me to the grave, you will um, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. The Messiah would never decay in a tomb. Psalm 118 verse 22 states, The stone of the builders rejected has become the capstone. And then the daddy of them all, Isaiah 53, and I say that because you really do need to read that chapter from time to time in Isaiah. It's amazing. But here's just a few of the things in this chapter. He was despised and rejected. He took on our affirmities. He was pierced for our transgressions. By his wounds we are healed. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. He bore the sins of many. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. Amazing words. And then there's Hosea 6 verse 2. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will restore us that we may live in his presence. I think those all kind of point toward Jesus, do they? So as the risen Christ walks along with these two disciples, the important thing for them to understand is why it was necessary for all of these things to have to happen to the Messiah, to understand that all of the scriptures of the prophets were pointing to the Messiah, the Christ, and even this Jesus of Nazareth. But sadly, even after a quite lengthy teaching by Jesus, these disciples still don't get it. They don't see, they don't understand, and you can almost sense that Jesus is rolling his eyes thinking, well, what more do I need to do to get through to these guys? But then finally, toward the end of the day, they arrive at their destination. Now, Middle Eastern hospitality requires the person who is at the house to invite a stranger in for a meal and for lodging. That is an absolute necessity. That goes all the way back to Abraham, if you can believe that. And so, but Jesus also is how this works. Jesus has to first say, oh no, I'm going on. I can't uh, take, you know, I can't come in. And then the, the, the owner or the person who is inviting even more emphatically will say, no, no, you please, you must come in. And then the other person goes, okay, thank you. So that is the way it has to happen, and that's why it was written that way in, by Luke also. So after they insist, Jesus accepts the offer. They sat down to a meal. Meals are central in that day. Let's face it. I hope you can say this. Meals are central in our lives today, too. And I'm not talking about the drive through at Wendy's or something. This is where we sit down with family. We sit down with friends. We sit down with strangers. Um, meals offer fellowship. It offers understanding. It, it offers, if even there's a dispute, disputes can be ended over meals. Meals are an important part of our lives. It's a time to get to know others. And I think it's interesting that at this meal is being served that the guest, being Jesus, now becomes the host. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way or not, but what does he do? He takes a loaf of bread, and because it's after Passover, he takes a leavened loaf of bread. The bread has risen, and the person breaking the bread has risen. He blesses it, he breaks it, and offers it to them. And suddenly in an instant, they recognize him. And then in the next instant, he vanishes. You know, sometimes understanding comes to us through action. 
we see, we consider, and then we understand. Remember, that's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago in the book of John, where John put that little piece in the middle of them looking into that empty tomb when he said, we see, we saw, and we see. All three of those words were a little different. One was physically, you see. The second one is you chew on it, trying to make reason out of it. And then the third one is, oh, I get it. That's what's happening here, and that's what Jesus is doing to them. He gets them to stop thinking of the hopelessness and the sadness and the, finally to understand, to get what he was saying. See, for everything to come together, and it does. They look at each other and they say, weren't our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us along the way? All of those scriptures, all of the prophecies set their hearts on fire, especially when he opened the scriptures you see, this is that aha moment, that last C, when they understand. Now, as I said earlier, the scripture helps us to concentrate on the important things of our lives. So here it is. Questions like we need to ask, am I doing the right thing that makes a difference? Am I fulfilling God's intention for me? Am I using my gifts to their best ability? Or how about even something that's important? Am I going in the right direction? That last one, I think, really is one of interest that we need to look at. The disciples were heading home. They were giving up. In fact, they, as we like to say today, they threw in the towel. They went, it's over. And they just started heading for home. But Jesus came along. And what did he do? He walked with them. He talked with them. And he used kindness, love, patience. The lesson here is that he will never abandon us. That's the important thing. It's Jesus above all things. He will never abandon us. Even when we find ourselves heading in the wrong direction. Jesus is there prodding us, tugging us. And he's tugging at our hearts and our minds. Remember when he says, where's your heart? But it's also, where's your mind? To bring us back onto that one true path. So the truth of the matter is, we desperately need Christ's presence in our lives. And this is the greatest understanding, the individu whether it's individually or whether it's collectively. That's us as believers. We need him constantly in our lives. That's why once their hearts were set on fire, and they saw and believed. That's why they jumped up and they ran back to Jerusalem. And might I say in the right direction. To tell the others this good news. The good news. The gospel. What Jesus is saying. I have arisen. I'm here for you. I stand with you. I walk with you. I am with you always. See, that's our most important of things in our lives. Now, our last lesson, though, in our scripture is on the road. When they recognize Jesus, what do they do? They hit the road. They couldn't help but share him. So they hit the road. They ran back. They ran back to Jerusalem to tell the others the gospel, the good news. So you see, when our eyes have been opened, we will always want our neighbor's eyes to also be opened. Am I right in that? I mean, we really look at people that don't know Christ, and I think we feel sorry for them. But we can't just feel sorry for them. We've got to reach out to them. And how do you do it? In order to do that, we need to be on the road. The road is very important. If you think about the road, the road is all over the Bible. Mary and Joseph, where were they? On the road. <laughs> the Good Samaritan, where did that happen? On the road. There's the prodigal son coming home to the father. Where? On the road. The woman at the well, Jacob's well, was right there on the road. Even Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem was on the road. And we really can't forget Saul and his encounter on the road to Damascus. You see, every one of these is a life-changing experience with Jesus on the road. That's what has to happen. 
in here, in the safety of these walls, we, we get to see Jesus, don't we? We talked about that also. Jesus comes to us every Sunday here through scripture, through song, through prayer. I hope you feel him here now. I really do. We get to see who he is and what he's done for us and what he's done for others. He comes. He breaks bread. He offers the cup, which is his body. But it's out there on the road where we get to share our Lord and our God with others. We come here to get that. And then we go there and spread it. And I think the church has been a little bit lax in doing that. And I'm not pointing at us. I'm saying all in all. We have been. We've been a little too comfortable, I think, in this country. That we've really forgotten that we have a great God that needs to be shared with others. You see, the two disciples' hearts were on fire. So my question to you is, is your heart on fire with love of Christ? That's how we all should feel, is it not? We should feel that every day, Sunday through Saturday, and start it all over again on Sunday. We should never be too weighed down or too overwhelmed, but on fire to spread the good news. For you see... We have a Lord and God who walks with us and he talks with us and he always tells us that we are his own. That's kind of a good song to us. Amen. So what do we do? I said we gather here every Sunday, don't we? It's a good pattern for us to follow. We have to understand that Jesus broke bread. They saw. They understood. Maybe we should also consider extending this same hospitality with our neighbors out there. We need to reflect on the common bond that we all have here and even those out there. Have a meal with somebody that you may not really think is a good person. You get to find out that they're probably a pretty good person. We, we need to find common ground. We need to share that common ground with others, especially the breaking of the bread and the wine that's been shared. And then we need to be open and willing to tell the story of Jesus. I, I think at this moment, I, the song I love to tell the story, I think fits here so well. But I just want to read the second verse, because sometimes we, re- we sing, and sometimes we don't think about the words enough. But think of this as you having to walk out that door and meet somebody else. All right, is so your heart on fire? I love to tell the story. Tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. Wow. Those are impressive words, are they not? So we have come now to that point where we're going to share this love, this love feast that Jesus gave us together. So as we're um, preparing for this meal, and of course, all who believe in Jesus are welcome at this table. So let us uh, contemplate that a few moments and then as the uh, elements are being distributed we will sing Come Share the Lord.
For I receive from the Lord what I now also hand on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took a cup also after supper, saying that this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we all proclaim the Lord's death till that glorious moment he returns. Amen. join in our closing hymn, the last two verses of Amazing Grace. Joy, sir.